This is a watch that I didn't expect you to like, but you brought up a great point in the fact that what if Joe Genta designed the Royal Oak and then the next watch that he was commissioned to design was Hamilton and it was under $2,000. It would have changed the history of watchmaking. And that's essentially what this is, Christ- but in 2023. Christopher Ward, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> What is up, watch fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Vintage Watch Shop. My name is Michael, and today we're looking at the Christopher Ward 12. The whole world of watches basically wants luxury integrated sports watches, particularly with blue dials, right? Yes. Everyone wants this, Everybody. right? Everybody, yep. Paddock and AP made the trend, and everyone that has capitalized on this has done so basically above $15,000 into the 20s and even higher, right? Mm-hmm. And now Christopher Ward just introduced an incredibly interesting and frankly high quality alternative at under $2,000 and the entire watch world is like, what the heck is going on? And they said this is Genta inspired and they have a massive designer behind this yep. and this is an amazing watch. 40 millimeters, 38 hour power reserve, 9.95 millimeters thin, very yep. thin. Titanium is a millimeter thinner, lug to lug 44.5. More water, res- what do they say? More water resistant, cheaper, same material, great loom, amazing dial. It's insane. And and it's from another designer that is responsible for one of the most iconic or one of the most beautiful and iconic watches of the last 15 years. It's unbelievable. This is bizarre. This whole release from Christopher Ward took me by great surprise. Yes. Uh, rewind a little bit. Uh, Christopher Ward's Belcanto watch took me by surprise, or took everyone by surprise, the world, that, right? Yes. Christopher yes. Ward historically has been a manufacturer of, you know, affordable, uh, not necessarily groundbreaking watches. Um, yeah, I think, that, I think that's a, it's a pretty good quality, but nothing, you know, not, not, not groundbreaking, right? Yes. Cool, and not even in a mean way. Not in a mean way. Maybe the first watch that I thought was interesting was the um, was their Moon Phase. It was this enormous, yes. you know, Moon Phase with this with this Lumen. Very, very cool watch. Again, it wasn't particularly mind-blowing. Like it didn't, didn't change the way I looked at watches or looked at the category, but I really did like it. And but, for the price, it was incredible. But then the Belcanto came and now the 12 uh, yes. that has totally you know repositioned Christopher Ward and kind of really just put their you know put their dick on the table put their I, such and such on the such and such yes it's amazing so let's get into the watch the bel canto really was the first kind of like unzip i guess in that metaphor totally. where everybody was like Wait, what? Wow, I had no idea you were packing such heat. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time Christopher Ward walked into the shower. Exactly. Every other time he was a great team player, but now he like went to take a shower. Oh, God. Oh, wait a minute. I meant on the field. You know, in action. (laughs) (laughs) If he was playing capture the flag, like he was really good at chasing it down. (laughs) Anyways, the Bel Canto was the first thing where like we would go to watch meetups and the Christopher Ward guy would be the star of the show. Exactly. There would be more expensive watches from greater brands elsewhere, everywhere, and yet the Christopher Ward got attention. And you saw this everywhere. Oh, wow. I can't believe I can hear it. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a real complication. So then we have the 12, which is interesting because it's oftentimes related to the PRX. Mm. Interestingly, the PRX was actually released in 1978, Mm -hmm. so it's a reissue, Mm -hmm. and it looks like an integrated bracelet watch from the 70s that we all saw. Mm -hmm. Christopher Ward is saying, this isn't that. This is, in the way they put it in their marketing video, this fits into the Gerald Genta line. This is that same idea, which is a very bold thing, and you talked about, you know, them actually saying that in a video on their website is interesting for a few reasons. Yes. The first thing that kind of took me by surprise was the fact that they would even use Gerald Genta in their marketing material just because, you know, that is that is not typical and I didn't even realize that that was legal. I didn't realize (laughs) that you could just use the name of a historic designer um, and I believe that name and that brand is owned by LVMH. So the idea that they would use that in their marketing material was already surprising to me. Um, But then the second thing that kind of came to me was, okay, well this seems like a, you know, valuable watch. It seems like a nice watch, but my big problem with it is it's really just a ripoff. Right, it's just a ripoff of of Japex Antarctique, and and, and Japex Antarctique, I think, is really one of the most uh, beautiful and brilliant descendants of or grandchildren of the Genta movement. It was not designed by Gerald Genta, um, but it was just this this beautiful integrated sports watch that clearly rode in that history and that wave, but in a very unique and original way. So I said, wow, I, I don't really love the fact that Christopher Ward stole from 
from Jopek, an independent brand. I, I really yeah. didn't like that. It's a cheap that, shot. It's a cheap shot. And then we dug a little bit further to find that the designer of the Jopek, uh, Antarctique, is actually an employee of Christopher Ward. So the man that designed the watch that they we thought we were ripping off is an employee here. So yeah. it is the equivalent, not of a brand ripping the Royal Oak and making a new one. It's the equivalent of Gerald Genta going to a new company and saying, let's go round two. It's really, it's Second really generation. the equivalent to, like we said, of Gerald Genta. Instead of making something for AP, he then, or Paddock, I guess, in this next thing, if it was Genta, then goes down to a brand that's for, that's far more approachable. Yes. And iterates his design. Completely. That's where things get a little bit crazy. We'll talk about the watch and a few more things, but first, we forgot to say, what's on our wrist? Yeah, I'm wearing a Paddock Reference 96. It's a beautiful little watch, the original Calatrava. I adore it. Love that watch. We right. posted a video about it recently that you should check out. And but this, yep, we posted it with, the, with this strap, too. This is the 96 strap, new to the Theo and Harris strap shop. Yeah. We you know, wearing. that's a 31 millimeter watch. Yeah. Fits your wrist great. Super elegant, right? Yeah. It actually just fits great. Yep. I want one really bad. I am wearing the 18238. I guess how you should wear it if you are a rich man running through loosely, Austria, loosely and without a care. Yeah, gorgeous watch, blue dial, blue dial, Italian day wheel, fantastic, stunning watch. Yeah, great Absolutely condition. Love this too. watch, and it comes on the bracelet. And yes, the bracelet does. is fantastic. It's a beautiful watch. Yeah, all around, all around. So Highly go ahead it. and take a look at the Theo and Harris watch shop and strap shop for all of your watch and strap needs. Um, okay, so. The Here's, marketing material, right? Well, let me give you a quick rundown. Yeah. So, 40 millimeters, this is across steel and titanium. The steel one is 9.95 mm -hmm. and, and 9.95 millimeters thick, and titanium is thinner, 8.95 millimeters thick. Wow. Because it's a different movement. It's a chronometer movement on the titanium oh, wow. one. Wow. Still under $2,000. Amazing. That is a very slim watch. But interestingly, before we found out about who actually designed the watch, and still, I guess by extension, this is a little interesting step out of that because this isn't a Jopec thing, but they have 12 screws on the back of the watch as yeah. a nod to the Royal Oak. Yeah, which I don't particularly love. Yeah, that I'm kind of like, don't reference that watch. Didn't, like that. Yeah, didn't Make it your own watch. So I don't want to, I don't want to reference, but the rest of it is fantastic. So obviously, interestingly, APs start usually around 25,000, but you can go vintage, get way more. You could also find a steal. There's well, a ton of things. Yeah, well, because the because APs are so historically significant, the collector's market has just, you know, been insane, right? Watches yeah. that retailed, you know, at probably like $2,000 are now worth 100,000 or more, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the watch market has just is, has been remarkable, but the problem with the watch market, obviously, is because these watches are so expensive, it's very prohibitive obviously to get into it, right? It's, yeah. it's hard to just invest in a hundred thousand dollar auto RP yeah. It's not it's not so easy. It's not like you could divvy it up. Right, like our friends over at Masterworks and what right. they do in the collectible art world. Yeah. Masterworks has sold over forty five million dollars in art with the proceeds going straight to their investors. And they do this by merging their expertise in both the art world and their their comprehensive understanding of collectible artwork yep. as well as technology, right? They take in their aptitude in finance and technology to effectively uh, uh you know, divvy up, you know, shares of paintings. So something that, you know, one just couldn't simply afford, or most of us couldn't simply afford it, hundreds of thousands or millions of Picasso, dollars. Banksy, Monet, absurd. things like this. They're offering up fractions of those paintings uh, for sale uh, to, to their community. Yeah. Uh, and then thus enabling all these individual shareholders to profit when those pieces go to sale. And, and they've, they've sold a few. And, and, you know, and They've the, sold a lot, actually. They have 13 exits now with every single one returning a profit to their investors. And that's over 700,000 people. There are 700,000 members on the Masterworks platform. Their current portfolio is over $740 million uh, divvied up between 140 uh, different different assets. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredible. Like you said, people are literally waiting online to invest. Yeah, and these are SEC qualified offerings. You can find Masterworks filings at sec.gov and it's linked in the description and show notes. If you want to skip the line and check out what Masterworks is all about, you can check out the link in our description and give it a go. Sounds good. See you guys there. But then we get to the marketing material, which this is why I wanted to bring it to you because there was a classic watch marketing era, like the 80s, 70s, where it would be a bold statement on top, 
picture of the watch and then written in a very specific way. Yeah. So Christopher Ward releases a written ad that says stainless steel on top. Steel as in theft, not as in the metal. And then they say, in 1972, and this is where it gets interesting, famed designer Gerald Genta created an oxymoron. Priced more than many precious metal rivals, the luxury stainless steel timepiece was not an immediate success. But eventually, its tough, elegant body, integrated bracelet, and pattern dial caught on. A watch that dressed up for dinner or down at the pool. And ready? Today's 41 millimeter base automatic of that original watch cost 22,850 pounds, more than the new 12 named for its Dodecon 12 sided bezel and rear lock ring. Our watch is thinner, goes deeper, and offers a choice of these loom dials, titanium or steel, a polished, brushed, and sandblasted case of daylight and nighttime robbery. Do your research. I, I, it's a phenomenal. Woo! It's a phenomenal ad. It's a phenomenal ad. It's 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 a stroke of uh, you know. It's, it's close to a stroke of genius. Yeah. Um, again, obviously the watch design itself is very closely related to the Antarctic, so it's not this huge departure of originality. Of course. That is true. Yes. Um, but but the watch is absolutely beautiful, and they are right. At two, th- this, this watch did not need to be two thousand dollars. This watch right. could have been thirty eight hundred bucks, no problem, every day of the week, and yep. it still would have been a commercial success. Yep. Uh, and yet they priced this so aggressively; it's truly unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's it's actually wild. Like they, like they are, you know, they are actually delivering a value prop that is, you know, like almost unparalleled. It's wild. And what's interesting is the a lot of they talk about their price saving how they did it how they did this and a lot of it is just like okay instead of doing the bracelet this way we need to do the bracelet that way mm-hmm. because these bracelets are very hard to actually finish mm-hmm. because there's a lot of different layers on this watch but the ending question is okay so this is an $1800 watch let's say 2000 because after buying after fees and everything what if they did their own movement because that's where people would kind of discount the price this is a Salida movement on the inside if they did an in-house movement and put it in this watch, without upgrading polishing or anything like that, where can they price it? You know, I, I just wonder if they even should. I, I wonder if that's even a good, you know, decision. I, does it does it make the watch all that much more attractive to potential buyers? I mean, especially I just, in the Christopher Ward it, world. Exactly. I don't know if it would have made it all that much more of a value prop. I really don't. Keep in mind, this whole in-house movement thing is is largely quite a farce. I mean, you know, all these different brands in the watch world are basically just modifying, you know, not in-house movements and making them in-house. So. That's I don't really put that much stock into that. I, I, I'm putting stock into, you know, the quality of the construction, the quality of the design, and of course, the quality of the movement, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a movement they developed in-house, right? I'm mm-hmm. a vintage watch guy, right? I, I, my expertise is in is in the 20th century, you know, watchmaking. Yeah. So I am very used to brands using each other for help, right? Someone's making the case, someone's That's making the That's part of the, the fun dial. of vintage watches. Exactly. That was that was a huge part of the, the system of making watches back yeah. then. Cartier was using this one for their cases and this one for their movements and yeah they were doing designing and they were overseeing everything but it was a collaborative effort in many ways yeah um jlc was making the movements for the ap right so put it put it right there right if if ap's original royal oaks were powered by jlc movements why can't the christopher ward be powered by another price comp right like the salida so i have no i have no logical problem with it okay then final question and this is more of a theoretical question the Bel Canto did something interesting for me, and I think for a lot of people where I was like, oh, I didn't think a watch with that complication could be under, let's say, $10,000, making mm-hmm. up a number. I just didn't think that was a thing. You know what I mean? Right. So, that was very interesting. This watch, I can still understand the price. It's nothing mind-blowing. But if they released one for $2,500, say, going up a little bit, and they actually finished it, to an insane level or mm. did something else, you know, in-house, something like that. Mm. Modified it where it's now like, okay, this is basically what I'm reading from these other brands that charge four or five times more. What does that make this watch? And what does that say about the entirety of the luxury watch world? It doesn't have to be this big sweeping statement, but that's where you start to see like, wow, you did what with yeah, how much? I think that, I, I again, I think that Christopher Ward could have priced this a little bit higher and they would have done just fine with it. Sure. Um, that being said, the, the, the price structure here it does say to the world. Um, Look at how close we got for this price. Yeah, like yes. you guys may be a little bit expensive. You know, the yeah. Christopher Ward is very low, but the AP is probably a little bit high at twenty five thousand dollars for a base time only. Like that's a lot of money, um, and that's probably not 
like that is the norm, but I don't know how justified that is. Like, what is AP's margin on that? It does beg the question. Right. Again, not right. for people who are looking to buy APs necessarily, but for a lot of people, like a lot of people that are saying, you know, oh, wait, oh, wow, this Christopher Ward's actually bringing up a good point. Like, how much money is AP making? Because this watch is good. Like, the finishing is great. Yeah. I'm not saying it's $25,000 good, no. but it's it's $2,000 good. And I don't know if the AP is is 10 or 11 times is good. That's where it gets That's interesting. That's the question. Yeah. And frankly, I don't think, I mean, the answer I think is probably no. Um, now, there's a lot more that goes into it, of course. Of, of course, right? I, I, I do own a Royal Oak and I don't own a 12. So, the, course, you, know, the, you know, at the end of the day, your your behavior is sometimes a little bit different than than the logic, right? Yeah, of course. Because uh, there is a large emotional element to, to buying a Royal Oak and it's big, right? There's also um, just a lot more on the manufacturing end and stuff like that. Of course. But for those guys that aren't loop guys... Exactly. You're like, like, wait a minute. So this is good. If this is two thousand dollars, what would I get for five? What can you make me for five? Right. Like, I want to spend five. What can you deliver there? It's interesting. It yeah. really is. So this is this is a this is a surprising move from a from a unexpected source. And I'm glad to see Christopher Ward doing this. I'm glad to see they're doing well. Um, Michael and I always, while we we love expensive watches, blah 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 blah, we root for the smaller brands yeah. constantly. I had Christopher and, Ward's in college. All four years. And everyone knows it, right? Everyone everyone knows. Our favorite brands, really, like the brands that we genuinely root for, the brands that we recommend, are generally speaking under $5,000. And that is the truth. Yeah. You know, and that, it's it's just consistent, right? It's, yeah. So, so I'm glad to see they're doing well. Um, And, and yeah, I'm glad to see they're doing well. What about the designer conundrum there? Yes. So the designer conundrum is is fascinating. So Adrian Buchman yep. did the or was on the credited list of people that was with Japek. Yep. Japek. Now he's at Christopher Ward, but the guy that was credited to design this watch is Will Bratfield. Right. So that's a little interesting. That's like, so, yeah, someone makes a painting. You make the painting, then you come work for a company, and they're like, Michael's going to make a painting. And I make a painting that looks like my painting. painting. That's kind of weird. Um, yeah. You know, it's a little bit weird. Uh, if you Google who designed the Japek Antarctique, Buchman comes up. Buchman, Buchman comes up. Yeah. So it just, there's narrative there. The fact that he works at Japek, he works at works at Christopher Ward now, and I don't know why they introduced this other character, this Will Bartfield. No offense to Will, um, no, 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 like great watch, great watch, great job, and, I, and I'm sure your job was hard. I'm sure it wasn't easy, but I'm also very sure in the fact that your watch is is too close to to the watch that Mr. Bookman is credited with. For for me, if I was the designer, to take a lot of credit uh and, and I'm just like mano a mano man yeah. like if you do watch this like then that's how i feel um that does not mean you're not a great designer i hope that they, if you are a great designer they give you more opportunities in the future to do original work but obviously there was a hell of a lot of inspiration here <laughs> yeah. from your coworker, and i just feel like you you uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with working on a team and and you know uh the product ultimately being very close to what one of your coworkers did. Right. I just wouldn't take the credit for it. And I'm sure that wasn't your fault. I'm sure that was a that was a that was a marketing decision that came from higher than you, right? Uh, I would, at least I would believe that's the case. Um, but I still do think that was a weird marketing decision. Um, there had to be something complicated going on there. And the marketing. What's what's really interesting is the marketing decision. I feel like you would naturally decide on is well, we're going to market. This just extensively the fact that this guy that designed this very very expensive watch mm-hmm. designed this watch yes. or inspired by this watch. Yes. Christopher Ward didn't say a thing, so I don't know if they were like, well, technically, like we don't we don't really want to like we're getting blatant and saying it's Genta designed and referencing the Royal Oak. Maybe you, maybe it's a legal issue. You don't really want to blatantly say you wanted a front man. Maybe we can't say who actually yeah. designed it because when he worked there, he signed something something that right. said X Y Z. Yeah, maybe maybe that maybe that's the explanation. Either way, um, it, regardless, it is a fantastic watch. Fantastic watch. Would have loved it if you dove into the design a bit more, as in like the people behind it, because it is a lot of stuff to say. Genta inspired, reference the Royal Oak, yeah. reference this Jopek, reference all of this. But either way, fantastic watch. Industry disrupting? Um, uh, disrupting. I don't know if it's disrupting, but I think that it is. It is. It is one of the greatest efforts to serve the the affordable watch market 
Period. Like I, I, yeah, I think that the PRX was great. This is better, yep. uh, but the PRX did a lot to serve that market. Got a lot of people into watches, so that's amazing. It's, the PRX did a did a public service to this industry. I think this is doing a public service in a very similar fashion, yeah. um, and just taking it up a notch, right? I would so, agree. So yeah, I. I, I Congratulations, Christopher Ward. I think you did an amazing job. And, and when these watches are released, we'd love to review them. We'd love to go in the metal. Like, that, that, 100%. That's it. It's They're already simple. released. Yeah, well, I'd love that. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to see one. I'd love to see one in light blue. Uh, I don't know <laughs> as a gift. I'm just you know. And titanium. Yeah, titanium. Yeah, but um, great job. That's it. 